You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Mulcahy, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. We are uh, happy to have you on. So welcome to the podcast. Great, Cody. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know why it took me so long to reach out to you to ask you to be on the podcast, but, you know, I definitely uh, I feel like you'd be, you know, a great guest to have on. And I know you're passionate about a lot of things, and I, I thought this would be a great topic to have you come on and talk about. So I'm interested in, in looking forward to this uh, to this talk. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of go over some of the issues related to the female athlete. And I uh, definitely want to give a shout out to you and your uh, your sort of partner here with how successful you've been with the podcast. So congratulations to you guys and wishing you lots more continued success. Oh, we appreciate that so much. And so typically how we start off is we ask, you know, this is kind of a couple of questions, just getting to know you and then we'll dive into the topic of the day. So first question I have is I know for those listening, when, when I do an introduction, they'll they'll realize that we both are at Tulane. We're a part of the same institution. And so what made you want to go into, I guess, academic, the academic side of orthopedics? Um, so I have always loved academics. I mean, certainly we all get exposure to that in residency, but um, that's kind of where my passion for research and teaching started. And I knew, you know, in fellowship, when I was looking at jobs, I only looked at academic practices because I really wanted to be in the setting where I could work with medical students, residents, fellows, uh, do research, be in an environment where that was supported, um, and also have the opportunity to participate uh, sort of nationally as a result of those things. Um, and so, so yeah, that was always my focus. Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. And, you know, you always get to give back and teach others. And I know there's a certain sense of gratification that comes with that as well. So for Absolutely. those listening, yeah, yeah. And, and for those listening that are uh, maybe considering academics, there, you know, there's some reasons right there why you, why you should do that. Uh, next question is a question I think we've asked maybe one other time on this podcast, but kind of off the wall question. But if you could have a billboard anywhere with say that that says anything that you wanted to say, where would it be? And what would it say? You could say go Saints. You could say whatever. <laughs> well, I'm from the Northeast, so um, go Patriots. Although I, you know, have been in, <laughs> I know, right? Maybe we shouldn't say that out loud, but um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think it would say something like "Stay fit, stay healthy," and have a have active people. Uh, you know, yeah. men, women you know, doing a lot of different things in terms of like just being active and athletic because some that's something that's really important to me. Yeah, I think it's super important and, you know, to, to stay healthy, stay active, you know, you know, that, that just helps with, you know, overall, you know, mood and longevity with life. So, you know, great answer to that. And the last question is, do you have any interests outside of the field of orthopedics that you like to do? I do, I do. And, uh, and that sort of ties in with my billboard uh, announcement, but um, probably my biggest interest is um, just being active. And I, I mean, I, I work out a lot. I ran track when I was in college. I was a long jumper and a sprinter. And um, although I can't really continue those activities now, I think I probably <laughs> would hurt myself if I tried to long jump. Yeah. Um, but I, for example, I'm playing on a recreational soccer team. That's something, I mean, I played soccer in high school. And so that's fun to be able to continue that sport now. And I work out and I like just to do a mixture of activities like between, you know, cardio, work, cardio workouts and strength training. Um, and that's the type of thing, like that's the main thing that I do for myself. And it helps me sort of reset. It helps me focus. Um, I like to work out first thing in the morning and it just really, I think, sets a good tone for the day. Yeah, I'm also a fan of the early morning workout. And for the same reason you just said, kind of gets the, gets the day going, uh, gets your blood pumping. So even this is super early, because, you know, sometimes I had to be up pretty early for different rotations, but I still try to get a morning workout in when I can. And I, uh, the, the yeah, deep your, your workout is probably earlier than mine. I mean, I'm usually like working out <laughs> at like six in the morning, but for you, it might be four or oh, five. Yeah. I don't know. So it's, it's a little bit earlier. It's definitely around four thirty-five ish sometimes. Yeah. But yeah. Anyways, let us switch topics to switch kind of gears and get into the topic of the day. And we kind of want to, you know, talk about the female athlete. And, you know, I just want to give kind of a little bit of background in, in the history, if you can, Dr. Mulcahy, kind of if you can just give us like a little history of the female athlete and kind of what's changed over the decades and, you know, why this is uh, an important 
thing to, to, to know about and talk about? Yeah, so I think certainly there's been a, a big shift in focus to the, the female athlete in the past like several decades. I mean, really this began um, in 1972 with the passing of Title IX. And that actually impacted a lot of different areas, but the underlying, I mean, we, we know it most, uh, we sort of, we hear about it the most with regards to athletics, because um, that is where it definitely had a huge impact, but essentially it kind of leveled the playing field in terms of giving women access to sports. Um, and so there had to be equal representation um, of sports for male and female athletes. And with that came a huge rise in the number of women participating in sports and consequently injuries um, in female right. athletes. And so then we really started paying attention to what types of injuries female athletes were sustaining. Um, you know, some are similar to injuries that, you know, male athletes sustain, but there are some that are unique and there are some that are more prevalent in female athletes. And so that has really become a huge focus, both among orthopedic surgeons and also primary care specialists sports medicine physicians, I mean, even physical therapists, athletic trainers, right, have a huge interest in understanding um, the sort of intricacies of the female athlete. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And, you know, that's one of the things that I was at least thinking about when I was reading on this. And, you know, you realize that before this, you know, a lot of the, the female athletes had to wear men's shoes, or there wasn't, you know, uh, clothing for the female athletes. And, you know, so with time, just like you said, you know, it increased women in sports, and that kind of leads to an increase in the in the injuries for women and you know kind of the, the differences of you know female and male athletes that we'll that we'll get to here in a bit but you know I kind of just wanted just to start off you know kind of just give you a general case I don't know if this is how they come to you in person but this is what I I thought it may possibly be like so uh Dr. Mulcahy say you have a 16 year old female who uh who comes to your office you know she's super active plays soccer plays volleyball she likes you know long runs playing running cross country but has been sedentary due to COVID after for the past, you know, five, six months. And she's coming with her parent interested in playing on sports in her senior year. And it's just kind of wondering if there's any specific exercise or things she should be doing with, you know, regarding kind of conditioning and making sure, you know, her, her, um, her athletic skills are, are on point. Yes, this is a great scenario and certainly appropriate for our current time. Um, you know, the onset of the pandemic was obviously very abrupt and just put a, um, you know, an end to all of our sports in the spring. And everyone was, you know, for the most part, people were inside and not really doing much in the way of athletics. So I think, you know, as the first couple of months of the pandemic passed, athletes were trying to figure out, you know, what can we do? What can we do remotely? What can we do via Zoom? What can we do, you know, inside and outside of our house in small groups? Um, and uh, so it gradually picked up. And certainly if you live in an area like we do, Cody, in New Orleans, where you can be outside most of the time, that was hugely beneficial uh, to have that space for, for people in many other parts of the country where it was cold weather for the first several months of the pandemic, that had a huge impact um, yeah. and really limited what people could do. So I mean, in, in general, as athletes have been picking up, you know, and this and our 16 year old female soccer player here thinking about resuming uh, playing soccer and volleyball. Um, one of the most important things is to is that that, you know, they won't have that normal preseason. It wasn't built in. They didn't have like the summer soccer, or the preseason volleyball. Um, and so it's really important to make sure that, you know, as I'm talking to her and her parents, that they make sure that they understand that it's important to have that lead in period, that they have time for the body to get conditioned, that she's working on not only her cardiovascular conditioning, but she's also starting some strengthening. Um, and because this, this girl is playing sports where there's a very high risk of ACL tears that we, you know, I emphasize to them the importance of incorporating some injury prevention exercises. And these do not add a lot of time to what she's already going to be doing. These things are really easily accessible. You know, the FIFA 11 plus, uh, um, exercises are probably the best known and are, are very easy to follow. They're laid out really clearly. So that's something they can access online. Um, and so that I would emphasize those things to them and, you know, the importance of her doing things independently, but also starting to work in small groups because the ball skills, both for volleyball and soccer are really important. So doing those things safely, um, would be, it would all be things that I would emphasize to them. Yeah. And I think that's important, especially just you, like what you just mentioned, the, the leading up to, uh, like leading up to the season, cause there's not, you know, normally not a, a preseason because, as many of us know, if you just kind of have a sudden increase in activity, that kind of can have you be a little bit more prone to certain injuries, you know, I don't know, possibly stress fractures and, you know, other 
um, other types of injuries and conditions. And is there anything in particular that you speak with them about when they ask about specific exercises that they should be doing? Yep. So, um, so for athletes, I focus on, um, I mean, when we're talking about, if we think about ACL injuries, for example, like we're not only focused on the knee, right? We're focused on hip, core, knee, like all of that is absolutely critical to optimize biomechanics. Um, and there've been some recent studies, I think one in particular out of AJSM, which was very recent, probably within the past couple of months, which talked about the importance of core strengthening <clears throat> specifically, and actually potentially even incorporating that as a measure when we determine if athletes are ready to return to play. So for example, after an ACL reconstruction, but, uh, but certainly core uh, and ab exercises are very important to incorporate into conditioning and strengthening because the core is what holds the whole body, right? So there's a lot of force that's coming from the core. So the core needs to be strong so that the lower extremities can be strong as well. You know, in focusing on her as a soccer player, like I certainly would emphasize to her, emphasize the lower extremity type exercises. But if we also consider her volleyball activity, so it, it all depends sort of what, what uh, you know, time of year we're going into. Now, normally here in New Orleans, volleyball is in the fall uh, and then soccer would be in the winter. But so for her as a volleyball player too, as she's approaching that season, uh, emphasizing upper, upper extremity strengthening. So the periscapular mus muscle, scapular stabilizers, like that's very important for her. Um, and it doesn't have to be heavy weights, right? So um, just light weights, emphasizing form, always emphasizing form, whether we're up talking about upper extremity or lower extremity exercises. Um, so we would talk about those types of things. The injury prevention program I alluded to, FIFA 11 plus, that focuses largely on, um, you know, hip and hip core and knee type stuff. Um, and I think those were all the things I was going to cover. Oh, one other comment, just in general. I mean, she's she's 16 years old, so she is in kind of this adolescent population. Um, when we think about high school athletes, and certainly when we're talking about male athletes specifically strength training tends to be built into their training. Uh, and that is, you know, for football players, soccer players, whatever sport they're playing, it just seems to be the norm, right? That's just, they right. do it once or twice a week. It's, you know, you know, their coaches, it's just what they're used to. Unfortunately, this, we don't really see the same trends for female athletes. And it's not because of a lack of interest on the part of the female athletes. It's more that it's not kind of the culture from coaches, um, et cetera, at least in the past it hasn't. I mean, I, I ran track and played soccer in high school. Weight training, strength training was not a part of my training at all. It just wasn't something that was emphasized. It wasn't until I was running track in college where strength training was a regular part of our training for both male and female athletes. So mm -hmm. I think this is um, a good time and an important thing to emphasize to everyone listening and certainly to this girl's parents who's at, who I would be talking to that incorporating an element of strength training and potentially even working with a strengthening coach um, or personal trainer type thing to oversee the exercises and make sure they're being done um, as they should be like proper form to minimize the risk of injury. Like those things are really important to consider. And, and parents of a 16 year old girl may not think about that. Yeah. And those are all things that can help just like you said, kind of prevent injury um, from happening with strength training. And then a lot of people don't realize, or you know, I've read kind of like the kinetic chain system with the whole body. So you need to make sure that your core is strong because core weakness can also lead to, to shoulder problems, can lead to hip problems, can lead to knee problems. So, you know, kind of just re-emphasizing the, you know, the kind of the, the ideal that you should be strengthening your core. Now, do you have, do you ever have any like conversation about nutrition with these, uh, with your patients, uh, you know, a teenage, you know, a teenager going into sports, do you ever talk about, you know, um, you know, any type of nutrition that sh they should be making sure that they get on a daily basis or what's your kind of your conversation like with that? I do ask them questions about nutrition. Now I am not a nutritionist. I do not have any expertise <laughs> in dietary related issues, but I know yeah. obviously in general terms. And, and so I do ask them about um, general things related to their eating habits. Like, do you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Do you have snacks? And, and I don't always even just ask them the general question of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I will ask them, what do you eat? Like they'll say yes. And that, but to them, lunch, may be a diet Coke and yep. a half a piece of toast. So Smart. understanding what breakfast, lunch, and dinner means to not only our female athletes, but our male athletes, um, but asking those specific questions is very important and helping them understand that as an athlete, they are burning a lot of energy. And so it's just like 
gas in your car, right? Your car is not going to go if you don't have gas in the tank and the body is the same way. And so it's helping them understand that they need to have enough fuel to account for the energy that they're expending. Um, and, and this kind of raises the, the topic of relative energy deficiency in sport, which is the now more co common ter terminology, which came off of the female athlete triad. And, and so I think a por an important thing to understand about this, I guess, just making sure everybody listening understands that the female athlete triad, when it was originally described, which was, I think, back in the 1990s, you had to have the extremes of each of these condition conditions. So osteoporosis, amener amenorrhea, and anorexia. And if you didn't have the extreme end, then you weren't considered to have this diagnosis. Now, with time, we came to realize that it was actually a spectrum of disorders. And so if you were anywhere on the spectrum, it raised a red flag and encouraged physicians to actually investigate further. So more recently, the International Olympic Committee actually created and proposed this diagnosis of relative energy deficiency in sport. Number one, well, because it focuses on low energy availability, right? So it's energy deficiency is the root of all of this. And the other key, key factor is that red S is not, does not only affect female athletes, it affects male athletes too. So I think that's something very, very important to take away from this. Um, but circling back a little bit to our nutrition discussion, when I'm talking to this female athlete or my female athletes in general about nutrition, about energy, um, what I explained to them too is that, and, and for us all to understand that it's not always about restricted eating, right? These, even, even athletes that do have relative energy deficiency in sport, it's not that they're doing it on purpose. Perhaps some are, and, and, and some athletes may, uh, and higher risk in certain sports, but, um, I think more often, and certainly something for us to consider, is that they may just not be eating enough to account for the energy they're, they're expending. And they're not doing it on purpose. They just don't think about how much fuel their body is burning to participate in all of these athletic activities. Right. Yeah. And then on the other hand, do you ever see where you have kind of overeating disorders? Is that, you know, is that a common thing that you see or that, have you seen that in your clinic at all? No, I haven't seen that problem, but you can imagine, I mean, that that could happen as well, depending on what type of sport the athlete is participating in. So it depends what the expectation is in that sport. Like if it's wrestling, okay, those guys, like you, they're doing everything they can to learn to lose like every ounce of weight up until <laughs> yeah. they're weighed right before their competition, right? right. Um, you know, gymnasts, et cetera. These are gymnasts, figure skating. You know, those may be sports that are more focused on leanness. Uh, but then on the opposite end, you know, you may have sports where you're trying to build bulk. And so I think on either end of the spectrum, you have to be careful about eating too little or eating too much. And you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier about the female athlete tried. And I kind of had this, this, this made up patient that I'll, I'll kind of tell you a little bit about. And then if we can go through that, that triad, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit more in depth, because I think I've seen that, you know, asked before, especially on TUS, and, you know, it's kind of a high yield thing that you may even see in your clinic. So, uh, so is a case kind of made up is, you know, say, for example, 15 year old gymnast who's practicing for months, nonstop, you know, high level athletes wants to make, wants, wanted to make the Olympic team. It's brought to you by a parent who states that recently, she's just kind of being more tired. And lately, and this complaining of just increasing wrist pain. And you mentioned a, a little bit earlier about the female athlete try. Can you kind of, you know, take us through um, what are some of the things that you'll see in patients that have this triad and what exactly the triad is? Right. So, so yeah. So again, when this was originally described, it really did. We were as, you know, medical field, we're focused on the extremes, anorexia, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis. And, um, with time again, it's the, the spectrum actually is the more important thing to understand that it, you don't have to be, have complete absence of menses, but having irregular menses is important, right? And that raises a red flag to have, not to be anorexic, but to just have low energy availability. And then with osteoporosis, right? Not having that extreme form of uh, low bone mineral density, but just being lower than would be expected for your age. Um, and the underlying issue in all of this is low energy availability because without enough energy that affects the hormonal fluctuations. And so in turn, our female athletes will then have irregular menses and without the normal fluctuations of the hormones, then the, we don't have normal development of bone. 
And unfortunately, like the time period when this is most often occurring, which is teenagers, you know, up through early 20s, so our high school and collegiate athletes, that is the time when we maximize our bone density. So for our athletes that are suffering with low energy availability, irregular menses, et cetera, and are not making enough bone, they're never going to achieve what would have been their maximal bone density. And then starting at about age 20, early 20s, the bone density starts to go down. Now it's not precipitous, but that goes down with time. And, uh, and so we really need that peak to be as high as possible so that when our, the normal changes throughout the rest of our life happen, that you know, they're starting with a good bone density um, and that decreases the risk of fragility fractures down the road. Right, um, and I, I love how you just kind of explained all of that and, uh, and broke it down. You know, of course, number one, the, the low energy availability being the main, uh, one of the main things and the main problems which can lead down the line to in, impaired uh, bone formation. And you know, if that continues on down the spectrum, it can lead to uh, it can lead to kind of osteoporotic, you know, or, or fragility fractures or fragility injuries. And for those listening that have not looked at an OBGYN book in years, just to kind of just go over what uh, a little bit about the menstrual dysregulation. So prim- primary amenorrhea kind of just, you know, when you haven't had a, when you haven't had a period and then secondary amenorrhea is when you were menstruating beforehand and then you don't have a menstruation cycle for a couple of cycles. And then illegal menorrhea are, you know, is when you have a cycle length greater than 35 days or less than nine cycles a year. And so these are some of the things to be on the lookout for, you know, when, uh, when you're asking or when you have these patients in your office and you're trying to figure out, you know, where they are, I guess, on that spectrum that you, that you talk about. Now, do, for the low bone mineral density, how, how often do, do people really get DEXA scans? It's like, is that an, like, I know we, that's the way that we measure the bone density, but, you know, do you get a DEX? have you ordered DEXA scans for these or you kind of just look at x-rays and, and you know, kind of just look at their bone quality? Like, what do you actually do? So that's a great question. Um, certainly in our elderly patients, we get DEXA scans and that's how we diagnose, um, you know, low bone mineral, bone mineral density or osteoporosis. In our young athletes, we do not routinely get DEXA scans, but, um, what I would say too, and I will like complete this discussion, but I just want everybody to know too, I'm not asking, I don't ask all of my female athletes about their menstrual history, but if there's any concern and I think it's related, I will ask them. Um, I just ask them, are you having regular periods? Um, And for, you you can imagine, you know, for a 14, 15, 16 year old girl, she might think it's cool that she doesn't have a period every month, Mm. right? Oh, this is so great. Like, it's not a good thing. And so that is, part of our job as orthopedic surgeons, and we want both our male and female orthopedic surgeons to feel equally comfortable asking these questions because we may be the first person, the first physician seeing these athletes, and we may have the ability to diagnose it, you know, diagnose relative energy deficiency in sport, um, diagnose this irregular menses and get the athlete to the right person. So when there's any concern, I will ask those questions. I have no qualms. I'll ask in front of the patient. I, you know, usually the parents are there. Uh, if the athlete doesn't feel comfortable for whatever reason, the parents can leave, but it's usually a non-issue. I mean, these questions are asked in a non-threatening way. Um, and the most common scenario in which I would feel you know, I, I would think to ask these questions is if an athlete's pre- presenting with shin pain. So I'm concerned either about mm. shin splints or a possible stress fracture, right? That is one of the, the most common presentations of relative energy deficiency in sport or female athlete triad. Um, and so that's where I'd start asking those questions. And if I have concerns, if they say, well, yeah, I've, I've had, you know, a couple months in a row, then I don't have it for three months, then I have it for a couple months. I would actually refer that patient to an OBGYN physician. And um, fortunately we have a great network here at Tulane uh, that we've developed. So I know right where to send the patients. Um, additionally, if I have any questions or concerns about their nutrition based on our conversation and just kind of getting an idea of the types of things that you know our, our 15 or 16 year old athletes are eating, uh, I would then send them to a sports nutritionist um, and potentially even a, um, a counselor. Like if I'm really concerned about a potential eating disorder or some restricted eating or some abnormal eating habits, uh, I would send, I would refer to all of those people um, so that that athlete can actually get the appropriate evaluation and the appropriate care. I mean, I, I feel very comfortable diagnosing these things, but then these are the specialists to actually treat the athlete. That is perfect. You at you 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 took all the questions I was just about to ask you about it and answered them already. So I, I love it. And 
um, I think we can move on to the next topic. And I know you've, you've published some papers on, you know, kind of concussions and female athletes. So can you kind of just tell us a little bit about, you know, what is, what's the, what should we know about female athletes and concussions? Right, that definitely female athletes are at high risk for concussions. And um, we found in this systematic review that we did recently that uh, in some ways, female athletes are at higher risk for concussion. And there are um, several factors that contribute to that. One can be potentially strength of the, the muscles in the neck. Uh, it could be factors related to training. It could be um, just sort of lack of diagnosis kind of, um, or not, not paying as much attention to it. Certainly we hear a ton about concussions in our football players or other contact sports that our male athletes tend to play, but there isn't in general as much focus on the female athlete. Uh, but it is very high risk in sports like soccer, volleyball players can get concussions. Um, think about sports where, where athletes can hit their head. I mean, potentially even something like water polo or, you know, um, with, where they're getting hit, hit, where they're hitting their head, either like with a ball, they're hitting another player. Um, mm -hmm. Other key points about concussions is to remember too, that it's not always a direct impact, right? It can be that they get impacted somewhere else in their body and their head is then jolted backwards. Uh, so important to keep that in mind too. And also understanding that a concussion is a traumatic brain injury. And, and I tell my patients that too, so that they understand that we take this very seriously, um, and have very strict protocols in terms of how we get them back to play. And, and those guidelines and protocols are really similar between our male and female athletes. Okay. And is it in general, you know, typically they can start, they can start the return to protocol or return to play protocol after they're asymptomatic and they don't have, you know, they don't have any of the neurological symptoms that are forgetting this. Exactly. Headaches, That's the key part is that they don't start the return to play protocol until they are symptom free. And, and of course we are dependent on the athlete telling us when he or she is not having any more yeah. symptoms, but as physicians, you know, as either orthopedic surgeons or primary care sports medicine physicians, it's our job to educate the patients, parents, coaches, et cetera, uh, of why it's important to be very honest about the symptoms that they're experiencing, because if they have another impact during the period where they have not completely recovered from the previous concussion, the repercussions can be quite severe. Yeah. And, and just, okay, that's great. And, and moving forward, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the female risk factors for having other injuries? You know, they can have, you know, their increased risk for different knee injuries. You know, I know we'll talk about ACLs. They can have, you know, uh, you know, patellar instabilities. Can we kind of just go through some of these injuries that, you know, females are at an increased risk for having, and then actually say which ones, what injuries those are? So, um, I mean, female athletes um, are at higher risk for, I mean, some of the things we've touched on, certainly much higher risk for developing stress fractures for some of the risk factors we've already touched on. Um, female athletes much more commonly than male athletes tend to have anterior knee pain or patellofemoral pain. Uh, also a much higher risk of ACL tears in female athletes for a variety of uh, reasons, very specific risk factors. And, and I'd be happy to talk in, about that in more detail. Um, certainly the one of the main contributing factors to increased risk of knee injuries around the knee is the fact that female athletes have a higher Q angle um, about their knee. And there are some great pictures of this on the internet too. And, and certainly this is something that comes up on the in-training exam, uh, but that tends to put more stress across the knee. Um, and so female athletes get pain with like squatting, kneeling, running, you know, going up and down stairs. That's very common with patellofemoral pain syndrome. And, and overall that diagnosis is much, much more common in female athletes. Yeah. And can you describe what the Q angle is? We may have some listeners that are fresh interns or, you know, second years that have not done a day of sports yet. Um, can you kind of just go over what that is? So. So yeah, so the Q angle is defined as the angle between the quadriceps, like the quadriceps muscle that they come down and the patellar tendon. And the Q angle in general is higher in female athletes than male athletes. And that absolutely is a contributing factor, especially for um, ACL tears. Yeah. Um, and, additionally, female, mm -hmm. there, there are studies too. I mean, I think there's a little bit more of mixed literature in terms of risk of patellar instability in female athletes versus male athletes. I think if you just think off the top of your head, um, you know, being in sports medicine and as you get later in residency and what you've seen like in some articles and, and on your tests, like certainly it comes up that female athletes are at higher risk for patellar instability. But I feel like there's some mixture in the literature as you read more and more articles. 
Um, right. But certainly that's an injury that we do see quite commonly in our female athletes, but not nearly as common as ACL tears. Okay. And, and patients that do come to your office and kind of complain of this anterior knee pain, is there any treatments that you, you know, do, do you send them to therapy or do you just, what I guess, what is your treatment algorithm? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a hard, you know, um, it is a hard thing to sort of manage and, and explain to the athletes that it is common. I think probably the most common age group, I feel like that I see this in are like teenagers too. They tend to have that anterior knee pain. And I think in part it's related to the fact that they're growing, right? And the mm. bones grow much faster than the muscles and ligaments, right? The, the muscles and ligaments can't keep up. And, right. and so I think it's an imbalance in strength. Um, and so for those athletes, for, you know, these patients specifically with patellofemoral pain, hundred percent, I would send them to physical therapy and they tend to get a lot better. And when they're in physical therapy, I totally defer to the physical therapist to decide what modalities may be helpful. If taping might be helpful, like certainly that's something that can be incorporated. Um, but I don't dictate that level specifically, but I will absolutely have them go to physical therapy and way more often than not, they get a lot of pain relief from that. Yeah. I think physical therapy, um, you know, does, does wonders for these patients. Not like I have many of these patients of my own and I've sent them to physical therapy, but from, from what I've heard from different, um, from different orthopedists, I've heard therapy helps very well. Now, you know, you know, the hot topic, or I guess a, a very common topic is, is ACL injuries. And if we can, can you kind of touch on some of the risk factors that lead you, that lead women to have an increased, uh, increased chance of having these injuries and then kind of how these, you know, injuries can be prevented. And then we can also touch about the treatment and kind of surgical options for these patients. Yeah, this is definitely a very, very common injury, much more common in female athletes than male athletes. And really it can be upwards of like six to eight times more common in female athletes for a variety of risk factors um, or for a variety of reasons, really the risk factors are broken down into two main categories. Those are uh, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So the non-modifiable things, those are obviously things we can't change, right? So that's hormonal fluctuations, that's you know, sex-related differences in knee anatomy, um, you know, the, the size of the notch, the size of the ACL, we can't change those things. Uh, and so we acknowledge it, we recognize it, but there's nothing we can specifically do about that. The other category of exercises are the uh, or risk factors are the modifiable risk factors. And those are biomechanical risk factors, the neuromuscular risk factors. So this has to do with the landing patterns of female athletes. So females tend to land with a val in valgus alignment of the knee. And that puts a tremendous amount of stress across the ACL. Um, additionally, female athletes tend to tend to um, decelerate with a, they have a quad dominant deceleration pattern. So what that means is as female athletes are slowing down, the quads are activated and that then the, the, that's all well and good, but why do we care? We care because the quads then translate the tibia anteriorly, which puts a lot of stress across mm. the ACL. Now in male athletes, there's much more of a balance between the quads and the hamstrings. So they don't have that pull um, anteriorly, whereas in the female athletes, the quads are way stronger than the hamstrings. And so in our injury prevention programs, we really focus on those components. We focus on landing mechanics. We try to eliminate that valgus um, alignment of the knee when athletes land and also work on strengthening and evening out the balance between the quads and the hamstrings. Yeah, I think that's you know, really important just to kind of highlight some of the things you were saying that, you know, quadriceps, um, that kind of, you know, when they decelerate, that leads to increased anterior tibial translation. You also know the valgus in the knee um, as well, which also puts more stress on the ACL. And so again, when you're, what are some of the things that we, that you should, I guess, counsel a, you know, a, a young athlete about as far as her landing from, and landing from, you know, jumping or whatever, uh, whatever activity may be, what are some of the things again, that we should just kind of focus on just to recap? Yeah. So I think another key component, um, with regards to landing specifically is that female athletes tend to land with stiff knees and stiff hips. So as we're talking to our athletes about this and thinking about how they're landing, you can think something as simple as landing kind of like light as a feather, right? Land, you land in a flexible kind of athletic position. So you land, let the force then be absorbed by the knees and the hips. 
Uh, and that makes it much less likely that they're going to tear their ACL. So it's both the alignment of the knee and the fact that with, you know they tend to land with stiff knees and stiff hips. So those are the things that we really focus on when we're trying to teach athletes, our female athletes in particular, to land appropriately. Now, male athletes, it's just sort of inherent. Like male athletes tend to land with proper form, um, whereas female athletes don't. And that's just the way sort of females are designed. So it, it's really important to start teaching these things as early as possible. So ideally kind of we're emphasizing these things at the middle school level. So before mm. all the sort of biomechanical changes happen as female athletes go through puberty. So if we can catch it when, when the female athletes are in middle school, we have a much higher chance of decreasing that risk of uh, ACL tears. Yeah. I think that's, that's, yeah, I think that's super, uh, super important to, you know, counsel these, you know, athletes as, as early as you can, because again, this kind of helps prevent against injury um, and helps, you know, make the, make play better, you know, better, you know, less injuries and I guess funner play per se. Now, say for the athlete that is so unfortunate that they're playing soccer, landed completely awkwardly, ton of knee valgus and external rotation of the hip and they did tear their ACL. What are some considerations towards, you know, ACL, con towards reconstructing an ACL? Do you have a specific graft choice that you use or what are, you know, what are some of the things that, that are at the top of your mind that you want to make sure that you pay uh, specifically, you know, attention to in your female athletes? Yeah. So you described obviously the, the classic scenario. So, you know, two thirds of these injuries are non-contact injuries. It's just, you know, they happen during cutting and pivoting sports. So soccer, volleyball, basketball are by far the most common. Uh, and so when I see, you know, the athlete in clinic for the first time, certainly I'm getting a detailed history and physical exam. If they're very swollen and stiff, um, I'm going to send them to physical therapy and I'd get an MRI at that point. Cause I, I, you know, have a very, very high suspicion for ACL tear. Um, and then when I see them back, I would go over the MRI with them, talk to them in more detail about treatment options, uh, and really more specifically graft options. So in a, you know, teenage athlete, a high level athlete, uh, there's really no question that we would do an ACL reconstruction. Um, and so then the discussion really comes down to what type of grafts, you know, what are the options? What type of graft would we recommend? What does the athlete or family, you know, do they have a strong preference based on, you know, maybe the athlete already had an injury to the other knee, or maybe they have a family member who had an ACL tear and had it reconstructed. So uh, it's helpful to kind of figure out where they are and what information they already have. Um, but I would, uh, you know, in my younger athletes, when I talk to them about graft choices, I do, I tell them about all the options. I tell them, you know, first of all, about autograph versus allograft and explaining the difference, uh, differences between them. I um, tell them that in younger athletes, certainly I would advocate for using an autograph because there's a much lower risk of re-rupture um, using that graft in that patient population. And then within autographs, uh, we have several options, right, which are all great. So, you know, um, bone patellar tendon bone, hamstring autograft or quad autograft. Now, um, you know, BTB and hamstrings have been around the longest or used certainly the most widely. Uh, quad autograft um, has actually been around for quite a long time, but has not obviously caught on nearly to the extent of our, our other two common autographs, although it has become more uh, common in probably the past five to 10 years. Uh, and for me personally, that is my autograft of choice. Um, I, I really like the quad autograph because it's a robust and incredibly reliable graft. It, there's a ton of collagen, actually way more collagen than you get from the patellar tendon. Um, you can, with the quad autograft, you could um, use an all soft tissue graft, which uh, is my preference, or you can harvest it with a single bone plug from the po proximal pole of the patella if you really do want to get um, that bone to bone healing, at least on, on uh, one end of the graft. So you have, it's very versatile and you can use it in really any athletes. Um, some advantages um, over sort of BTV and or hamstring, I mean, with the quad autograft, you don't have the kneeling pain that you can get fairly commonly with the BTV autograft. Uh, and then the hamstrings, I mean, in young girls, right, the hamstrings can be tiny. And, and unfortunately, we really don't know ahead of time, like before the surgery, before we're right. trying to harvest the hamstrings, how big it's going to be. And so we are all uh, well aware from uh, the literature that if that graft, you know, our, our quadrupled hamstrings, if they're not at least eight millimeters, right, there's an incredibly high risk of re-rupture. And so 
Um, I think you know many of us would consider augmenting uh, that with allograft, and then that raises the question: Well, is that actually beneficial? Like, is that graft really beneficial? Uh, so that is actually one of the reasons why I personally transitioned from hamstrings to quad autograft. I used to do hamstrings. Um, that was the predominant graft in my practice in the first few years. And then over the past three to four years, I've transitioned to using quad autograft uh, because it's very reliable and it's just a really big graft. Patients tolerate it well. It does not affect their quad function, their extensor strength, their you know ability to return to play. Like there are lots of studies in the literature supporting the uh, efficacy of the quad autograft. Um, and so I would really encourage others to consider um, using it and for residents listening to try to seek out cases and the opportunity to get exposure to that. Yeah, I know we've done a couple of cases using the uh, the quad tendon autographs. I think it's a pretty slick procedure. I like it myself, um, you know, considering the sports, if I go into it, it may be something that I will uh, may use in the future. And yeah, just like you said, it doesn't, you know, at least the studies show it doesn't have, you know, much, you know, you still have good quad function afterwards. And and you don't have that, you know, anterior knee pain or that pain that you get with kneeling that, that a lot of, or a, a portion of the patients that have a patellar, um, a BTB autograph get. So that is a, a good option. And then it, just like you said, sometimes you can use a bone plug if you want, or you can kind of just do all soft tissue quadriceps um, tendon um, autograft. Now, do you have a preference for partial thickness versus full thickness autograft? So I essentially, I harvest, uh, it's probably on average about eight millimeters thick, but essentially I go down as deep as I can without breaching the capsule, without creating a rent in the capsule. And, uh, and that's how I harvest every time. And it ends up being, you know, like I said, probably seven to eight millimeters um, in terms of thickness. Uh, and then I'll usually harvest about probably about eight centimeters in length. And you can easily do that on every patient. There are lots of studies supporting uh, the sort of average length of the tendon before you get to the rectus femoris muscle. So, um, so that's how I tend to harvest it. If for whatever reason, uh, I end up creating a small rent in the capsule, I just close that. So it is yeah. important to close that. I actually personally will close the whole defect from the harvest. Um, and you know, at this point in time, uh, I don't know of any studies that really show definitively either way, whether you, you know, whether you need to close it or not, but, uh, but you and I are investigating that. And so hopefully we we'll are. Get the answer. <laughs> <laughs> give it a little bit of time. We will have an answer. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, before we wrap up here, just a couple, you know, quick questions or quick topics, you know, you see, you know, at least sometimes like you'll see on YouTube or you'll see videos of, of, uh, female athletes with like a, a lot of um, laxity or, or shoulder mobility, you know, is there any, anything that you, you know, can touch on or, or talk about as far as, you know, shoulder instability in your female athletes? Do you see it more or just, or, or do you just see more laxity in the female? I guess kind of what's the difference between laxity and instability? Yeah, I think, um, I think there is more overall laxity in the female athlete than the male athlete. I don't think shoulder instability is more common. Um, and with laxity, I mean, certainly you see that more commonly in certain sports than others. So swimmers are a great example where you see a lot of laxity because that's what makes part of what makes them such great swimmers. But I think important things to keep in mind are that um, a female athlete with shoulder instability or laxity like is not the same as the male athlete with that pathology that like oftentimes we're working more to kind of tighten the capsule so it's not may not be as straightforward as just going in two you know two three anchors for the bank heart repair and that's it like in our female athletes we may be thinking more about taking some laxity out of that capsule um, and you know we we both learn a lot here from dr savoy in this regard um, so it is important to keep in mind that it's not always as straightforward in the female athlete as the male athlete. And so you do have to have sort of your antenna up and higher, um, sort of sense of suspicion and looking around and, and, uh, addressing any associated pathology, because it may not just be isolated to the labrum. Right. Yeah, totally agree. And, and last thing, before we wrap up here, we talked a, a bit about stress fractures and, you know, we talked about the, the female or the athlete tried a little bit earlier. Uh, what are some things to be on the lookout for, for stress fractures? And then how do you, how do you treat them? Yeah. So with stress fractures, um, really comparing like stress fractures to shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome. So when patients come in, just kind of complaining of shin pain, like I always get x-rays. So we'd get tib-fib films. 
I'll look at those more often than not, we don't see anything on, on the x-rays, but I do get those just to make sure because sometimes for a stress fracture that's been percolating for a while, like we can see that and, and you guys have all seen it in the books and certainly it's on the in-training exam. Um, but so I would get the x-rays and then on exam, one very important point, which just helps you distinguish between medial, medial tibial stress syndrome versus stress fractures is where the athlete localizes the pain. So if they say it hurts here and they point with one finger to this very specific spot, you're thinking much more of a stress fracture. Whereas if they're like, well, it's kind of here and they're just running their finger up and down the, you know, the medial aspect of their shin, uh, you're thinking more medial tibial stress syndrome. So, um, Initially, if, you know, if I'm seeing them for the first time, I'm not going to jump straight to getting an MRI or whatnot, but, um, but I will, you know, I ask them about their training. I ask them, has anything changed recently? If they're runners, I ask them about their shoe wear, you know, distance, et cetera, um, distance of running, frequency of running. And then in terms of treatment, certainly initially there's an element of activity modification. I very rarely, um, and my partners have this same philosophy. I very rarely tell my athletes that they absolutely cannot do their sport in any capacity, uh, but I may have them modify it. So certainly in, in athletes with, you know, shin pain or concern for stress fracture, I may say, okay, well, we might not, you know, cut out running for a bit or cut down certainly on distance, uh, you know, focus only on soft surfaces. But then in that case too, I encourage them to incorporate cross training. So to also incorporate low impact and no impact exercises so that they're still getting the cardiovascular workout, but they don't have the constant impact across their shin. Also, depending on how much pain they're having, I may put them in a cam boot for a short period of time uh, just to help rest the shin. And then if they come back four weeks or so later, you know, having modified their activities, maybe got new shoes, like plus minus the cam boot, probably there would be some physical therapy in there. If they're still having symptoms, I would get an MRI at that point. Yeah. And, and the MRI is just to be on the lookout to see, you know, if this is a, you know, stress reaction versus a fracture. And I guess to see if whether it's propagated it and, you know, cause these can turn into full blown, you know, complete fractures. If, you know, the, the activity is not modified and they continue to walk on it or run on it. And like, you know, it can, it can travel down that road. Exactly. Exactly. So we want to try to catch it early and, you know, I'm, I'm very comfortable working all of, uh, you know, working it up, doing all of these things. If it gets to the point where, you know, I have a question or whatnot, like fortunately we have other um, physicians in our group, our primary care sports medicine physicians who have a lot of experience with this too. And so at that point I may refer the athlete on, uh, but that's why we have such a great team. We're really lucky to have, um, you know, such a good group here. Yeah. Well, well, Dr. Mulcahy, I think this was a, a great talk. I think, you know, we went over, you know, a lot of different things, you know, about the about the female athlete. We talked a little bit about the history. We talked about um, some nutrition. We talked about, you know, the female athlete triad risk factors for, you know, for uh, patella, uh, for uh, anterior knee pain, as well as ACL. We talked about ACL reconstructions, graph. So is there, is there anything else, you know, that you want the listeners to get, get away or any one thing that you want the listeners to get away or leave this podcast, you know, remembering or any last words? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I mean, one main point I hope everyone can take away from this is that there are definitely injuries that are more common or are unique to female athletes and that approaching this with an interdisciplinary team is really critical so having, you know, a network of physicians, both, you know, orthopedic sports medicine, primary care sports medicine, um, OBGYN, sports nutrition, sports psychology, having physical therapists that you know and trust, athletic trainers, um, and then even endocrinology, et cetera, right? Having those connections are important to be able to get the athletes to where they need to go and making sure everyone's on the same page. So I think that that for female athletes, more so than male athletes is very important. And there are many programs or many institutions around the country that have women's sports medicine programs. We're very fortunate to have that here as well. And, um, and I think that that makes a big difference. And certainly our female athletes, both at the collegiate high school level and throughout our community here in New Orleans appreciate having access to all of those resources. So if you're in a community with a program like that, uh, definitely take advantage of it. Let your female athletes know and don't hesitate to send them there. Um, if it gets to the point where it's something you're, where you want to get more insight. Yeah. Awesome. I think that was great. And before we wrap up, we always give our listeners, you know, a way for people to reach out to you, whether this is 
Uh, you want people to follow you on social media, on Instagram, Twitter, if you want to share your handles or anything that you would like the people to know or to follow you, you can go ahead and let it be known. Yes, no, I would, uh, I would love to have anyone who's interested to follow me. I'm very active on both Instagram and Twitter, and my handle is the same on both. So it's at Mary K Mulcahy MD. Um, and I post lots of stuff related to sports medicine and orthopedics and, and some specific things related to women's sports medicine. Um, so I would love to be able to interact that way. And, and, uh, and certainly too, if anyone wants to, to, you know, reach out and contact me in a direct messaging for, uh, you know, to ask additional questions, I'd be happy to connect in that way too. Well, there you go. Thank you all for listening to yet another episode of the Nailed It Ortho podcast. Please go and leave a rating and leave a review and tell us how much you enjoyed this episode. And until next week.